I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. We are nearing the end of Joseph Smith's life in June of 1844. There's still so much to cover, but I thought today we'd go through a bit of forecasting for what we can expect in the coming future of the history of Mormonism. I was reading through Mormon Enigma, the excellent and groundbreaking biography of Emma Smith by Linda Newell and Valine Avery when I read this short passage on page 175, which fits perfectly into the context of our current historical timeline. Quote, Sometime that spring of 1844, George J. Adams hurried from the red brick store to the mansion to find Emma. He explained, The matter is now settled! We now know who Joseph's successor will be. It is little Joseph. I have just seen him ordained by his father. No extant account related Emma's reaction to the news, or if this was news at all. Perhaps Joseph had told her beforehand. Details of the ceremony, however, were preserved by James Whitehead, financial clerk for Joseph Smith which James Whitehead is such an unfortunate name. Anyway, Whitehead told a friend, William W. Blair, in 1873 that he was in the outer office at the time, but he heard others discuss the ordination. Later, under oath, he remembered there were about 25 people in attendance. Whitehead said, now quoting Whitehead, quote, Hiram Smith anointed the boy, and his father blessed him and ordained him, and Newell Whitney poured the oil on his head, and he was set apart to be his father's successor in office, holding all the powers his father held. End quote. Back to King and Newell. As an old man, Joseph III could not recall the specifics of the blessing, but wrote, I was called into the room over my father's store in Nauvoo, and was there anointed with oil and blessed by my father, and the privileges and callings to fit one to succeed him were conferred by name upon me. I was publicly acknowledged by my father to be his successor on the stand in Nauvoo in the presence of hundreds, possibly thousands of people. James White had remembered Joseph announcing that, quote, I am no longer their prophet and described him putting his hand on young Joseph's head and saying, This is your prophet. I am going to rest. End quote. This blessing, supposedly given in spring of 1844, marking Joe 3.0's ordination as rightful successor, is an important event in Mormon history and arguably one of the most disputed. It's notable that these sources in the biography Mormon Enigma, they were recounted long after the fact by people who were members of the RLDS church under the leadership of Joe 3.0 when he assumed the office of prophet and president of the church in April of 1860. The fact that Whitehead reported Joe's speech during the gathering like he was an old man who was headed into the woods to die reveals that Whitehead's memory was plagued with hindsight bias, and as Avery and Newell stated, no extant contemporary record exists of the proceeding that day or of the blessing itself. But why is this so important, yet so disputed? You see, Joseph Smith never left behind specific succession instructions in the event of his death. Every king or ruler of any kind is supposed to designate his successor prior to his own death, most often his son, preferably his firstborn son. But with Joseph Smith, it wasn't so simple. He'd received a revelation in Kirtland that if he should live into his 80s, then he would live to see the second coming of Jesus. Very few of us ever know when we're going to die until the moment it happens. Most likely, like, oh, I'm about to die, and then you're dead, right? Uh, but, but Joe had evaded death so many times that he probably thought himself invincible by 1844. Death was the only event that would remove the mantle of prophet, seer, revelator, prophet, priest, and king over all of Israel and all of the offices that he had manufactured from his shoulders because he never had any t intention of actually stepping down. But certain events in Joseph Smith's life precipitated him making an effort of appointing a rightful successor throughout his entire 14-year ministry. But appointing a successor requires a couple of character qualities that Joe was consistently short on, foresight and willingness to abdicate power when events require it. You see, Joe lived in short increments and made short-term decisions that most often best suited him at that time. 
He was also very jealous with his power. So much confusion that comes from Mormon authority fights all harken back to Joe's suffocating need to be the sole dictatorial power of the church. He was capable of dictating tasks to certain individuals, but he was always the decision maker with final say. When we consider the offices of priesthood and the constant evolution of each office's duties throughout Joseph Smith's ministry, that evolution is hard to reconcile with the idea that Mormonism is a restoration of the ancient religion that was instituted by Adam and brought to its final form through the sacrifice of Jesus, which was subsequently lost through the Dark Ages. If the one true religion existed, was lost, and then was subsequently restored by Joseph Smith, why did it have to evolve so much in his lifetime, and why did it change after his death? How are we to determine the rightful next prophet when the current prophet dies? So here's a fun exercise with believing friends and family. Why was Brigham Young the prophet after Joseph Smith? Usually the answer will be some wishy-washy form of the office of prophet is dissolved upon his death and then the keys are given to the quorum of 12 apostles so that the Lord can call the next prophet when the apostles give all the keys back to the man who holds the office of prophet. But simply ask this friend or family member, yeah, well, where is that found in the Doctrine of Covenants? Is that from the Book of Mormon? Is that somewhere in the Bible? Is it taken from some obscure passage in the Pearl of Great Price? The answer is, this idea of succession within the Brighamite tradition doesn't come from any scriptures because bloody Brigham Young made it all up. He made it up. There's simply no scriptural or even extra scriptural justification for the modern Mormon succession instructions. It's not even found in the Council of 50 Minutes in the Book of the Law of the Lord during Joe's life, and no official public statement from Joseph Smith could ever be construed to justify this idea of the po the apostles inheriting the prophet's keys until the next prophet is called by God. For those reasons, Bloody Brigham was very jealous and was proactive in his tenuous hold on power during the first two decades of his presidency. Brigham's power plays, they're going to come into focus as we progress through today's episode and, of course, into the coming schism crisis within the historical timeline of the podcast. The fact that Mormons today are unable to answer these authority and succession questions with any hard scriptural justifications, that merely underscores the fact that succession was a great source of controversy and division after Joe's death. This isn't because Joe didn't name a rightful successor, it's because he named so many of them at different periods of his life due to different extenuating circumstances. We're going to discuss those today, but let's first lay some groundwork. Mormon theology is obsessed with pure bloodlines. Pure knowledge is transferred from fathers to sons. Prophets throughout the Book of Mormon are almost exclusively sons of the previous prophets, almost always the firstborn sons. But it runs deeper than the Book of Mormon. The lectures on faith, which you know used to be included as the doctrine part of the Doctrine and Covenants, but they were removed in 1921, making it just the Book of Commandments. But the lectures on faith weren't present in the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants because that was the Book of Commandments. That was printed in 1833, and that simply contained many of Joe's revelations up to 1832. Joe's first military expedition in 1834 came to be known as Zion's Camp, which we're going to discuss soon. But this expedition was a colossus failure. Upon his return to Kirtland, he formed the School of the Elders, the first official male Sunday school gathering for teaching deep Mormon doctrine to initiates. In this School of Elders, various lectures were devised by Joe and Hinchpin Sidney Rigdon. They collected seven of these lectures and included them with the expanded edition of Joe's Revelations, which came to be the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. It used to be the Book of Commandments, the Lectures on Faith, which, you know, Book of Commandments, that was just Joseph's Revelations. Then the Lectures on Faith were added and that became the doctrine part of the Doctrine and Covenants. So this book was published under the new title of Doctrine and Covenants. One of the lectures on faith discusses extensively how true knowledge of God came through Adam to our current generation. This is lecture two, and the entire thing is painful to get through. Marie and I read through this on my Book of Mormon podcast back in October of 2018. So go listen there if you want to grind through it with us. But Here's a small sampling to illustrate my point from verses 31 and 33, quote, 
Adam, thus being made acquainted with God, communicated the knowledge which he had unto his posterity, and it was through this means that the thought was first suggested to their minds that there was a God, which laid the foundation for the exercise of their faith through which they could obtain a knowledge of his character and also of his glory. From this we can see that the whole human family in the early age of their existence, in all their different branches, had this knowledge, the knowledge of God, disseminated among them so that the existence of God became an object of faith in the early age of the world. And the evidences which these men had of the existence of God was the testimony of their fathers in the first instance. From father to son. End quote. Sorry. It, it, it's all from father to son. Everything within this lecture of faith is all father to son to son to son to son. So not only is the perfect gospel passed from father to son, but even the very knowledge of the existence of God is passed through patrilineal posterity. The entire lecture, Marie and I read through it October 2018, listen to it, lecture on faith number two, It or don't listen to it. The whole thing is like 56 verses with another 148 questions in the Q&A section. So a quick summary is that this gospel has passed from father to son for all human history and has been the source of of the drive for people to learn and understand the nature and mind of God. More than just illustrating how much of a windbag hinge pin Sidney Rigdon is, even giving yours truly a run for his money, the lecture encapsulates how important patriarchal succession is truly at the very roots of Mormonism. The Book of Mormon includes it as an underlying implication. The Doctrine and Covenants illustrates male lineal succession explicitly, and the Book of Abraham extends this succession to not only blessings, but cursings being passed from fathers to sons. So the reason I bring this all up is to illustrate that anybody claiming that Joe didn't believe one of his own sons would be his successor to the mantle of Mormon prophets here in Revelator they don't have any idea what the hell they're talking about. Very few things in Mormon theology are as cut and dry as the doctrine of patriarchal familial succession. Joseph Smith III was the rightful successor to his father in every sane world that takes into account the totality of Mormon theology. You may be sitting there thinking, hey, the Mormon church had two prophets named Joseph Smith in the 20th century, and you're right, but both Joseph F. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith were nephew and grandnephew of Joseph Smith. They were sons of Joe's older brother, Hiram sidekick of Biff Smith. At the time of Joe's death in 1844, Joe had seven male sons born to him. The first, highlighting how important firstborn lineal succession is, was named Alvin Smith, which was Joseph Smith's older brother's name, which was the firstborn son of Joseph Smith Sr., right? Joseph Smith to Alvin Smith is his firstborn, then Joseph Smith Jr., his firstborn son, is also named Alvin Smith. This also harkens to the likelihood that Alvin Smith was originally designated as the prophet, but Joe stepped into his place upon Alvin's death in 1832, or sorry, 1823, seven years before the Book of Mormon was published. So Joe and Emma's son, a little Alvin, only lived a few hours and then he perished. Joe and Emma's next son would become the rightful heir to the Mormon throne, but he met a similar fate as Alvin did. Young Thaddeus and his twin sister, Louisa, were both born premature and they died a few hours after their births. In the wake of that, Joe and Emma adopted Joseph and Julia Murdoch, twins who were born two weeks after Thaddeus and Louisa, but twins who had killed their mother during childbirth. This adopted Joseph Murdoch Smith died at 10 months old after falling ill to exposure in 1832. We discussed this all the way back on episode 26 of the show when Joe was dragged out of the house and beaten and he was tarred and feathered and nearly poisoned and castrated. But Joseph Murdoch Smith likely wouldn't have been made a rightful successor because he wasn't Joe's pure blood, right? However, in November of that same year, 1832, young Joseph Smith III was born, the first Smith infant male from Joe and Emma that lived more than a few hours past childbirth. The third son of Joseph, bearing the same name to survive childhood, made Joe 3.0, as Marie and I call him on My Book of Mormon, the perfect candidate to inherit the mantle of prophet upon his father's death. A question remained, though. When was the rightful time to designate Joe 3.0 as the rightful heir? 
When should he be endowed as the son to take the office of president and sole king over all Israel, especially as Joe himself was showing no signs of aging or illness or slowing down his empire building campaign? A proper king names his heir on his deathbed, but Joe didn't realistically expect to be on his deathbed any time soon in early 1844. The events which precipitated Joe 3.0's succession blessing in early 1844 alluded to at the beginning of this episode, they aren't really clear. But for whatever reason, this was chosen as the right time to give Joe 3.0 his blessing at age 11. Now we'll get into that blessing in a little while here, but first let's speculate on what may have precipitated this blessing at the time uh, at this time, based on the data set provided of all the previous people Joe designated as his successors in some way. So for this, I'm going to be leaning on the work of D. Michael Quinn in Mormon Hierarchy Origins of Power, uh, which had birthed an article that he published in the 1976 BYU studies that was titled The Mormon Succession Crisis of 1844. We'll also be discussing an article that Quinn wrote for the John Wimmer Historical Journal near the end of the episode. There is a significant wrinkle to this Joseph Smith the Third blessing and the related articles that we'll be discussing near the end of today's show. Let's get into the meat here. There wasn't a clear path of succession at Joe's death simply because he didn't leave clear instructions. From Quinn's 1976 BYU Studies article, quote, as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints since its establishment in 1830, Joseph Smith Jr. had been the apex of a pyramid of ecclesiastical leadership, but to many people, he was viewed as though he were the keystone of the existence of Mormonism. In this view, as the removal of the keystone from an arch causes the arch to collapse, it was assumed that the entire LDS Church would collapse if at Smith's death the role of the president were not filled properly and to the satisfaction of the general membership. A small group of men, most notably the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, had received private instructions from Joseph Smith in the spring of 1844 concerning the proper mode of succession. These private instructions, however, were unknown to the general membership of the LDS Church. In fact, by the summer of 1844, there was no explicit outline of presidential succession in print. This laid the foundation for a succession crisis among the Latter-day Saints when Joseph Smith was murdered by a mob on 27th June 1844. Not only did most Mormons have only the haziest concept of what should transpire in the leadership of the LDS Church if the founding prophet were to die, but between 1834 and 1844, Joseph Smith had by word or action established precedence or authority for eight possible methods of succession. Number one, by a counselor in the first presidency. Number two, by a special appointment. Number three, through the office of the associate president. Number four, by the presiding patriarch. Number five, by the council of 50. Number six, by the quorum of the 12 apostles. Number seven, by the three priesthood councils. And number eight, by a descendant of Joseph Smith Jr. In time, all but one of the major claimants were invalidated by their personal circumstances or the insufficiency of their personal circumstances or the insufficiency of their claims. For those few to whom Joseph had given definite instructions relating to secession, their course following the martyrdom was clear once the shock of the event passed. But for the average Mormon, the death of Joseph Smith Jr. created a sometimes prolonged crisis in which it was necessary to decide which of conflicting succession claimants was authorized of God. The schismatic fragmentation of the LDS Church that followed the martyrdom resulted from a multiplicity of succession precedents and a general lack of uniform understanding of what Joseph Smith's provisions for succession actually were, end quote. So the first mention of possible succession came in a revelation that Joe provided in March of 1833, which was canonized as section 90 of today's Latter-day Saint Brighamite Doctrine and Covenants. And verses five and six say this, quote, and all they who receive the oracles of God, let them beware how they hold them, lest they are accounted as a light thing and are brought under condemnation thereby and stumble and fall when the storms descend and the winds blow and the rains descend and beat upon their house. And again, verily, I say unto thy brethren, Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams, their sins are forgiven them also, and they are counted as equal with thee, Joseph Smith, in holding the keys of this last kingdom, end quote. 
This was 1833, the earliest true succession instructions that we can find. It states that when Joe is absent, the presidency of Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams holds equivalent power as the prophet. But this doesn't explicitly state that they would be the ones to take over when Joe's, Joe actually dies. It merely says that they are equal with thee in holding the keys to the kingdom. So to make this more explicit, when Joe was about to head out on Zion's camp, the first Mormon military campaign from Kirtland to Jackson County, Missouri, in order to restore the Mormons back to their land and the property from which the Missourians drove them, Joe decided it was a good idea to leave explicit instructions as to who would run the church while he was gone. On April 19th, 1834, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and Zebedee Coltrane, quote, laid hands upon bro Sidney. Sidney Rigdon, and confirmed upon him the blessings of wisdom and knowledge to preside over the church in the absence of Brother Joseph. End quote. Now, Quinn in his article points out that absence doesn't mean death, which makes these instructions less cut and dry than we would really hope. But consider the context of when this was given. Joe was leaving the Kirtland headquarters behind for a military expedition. He didn't want to lead in the first place. Now, every military leader needs a trusted right-hand man back at the homestead to keep the lights on and to pick up the mail while the leader is on his crusade. That was all that this designation really did. It merely appointed Hingepin Sidney Rigdon to be the acting prophet until Joe returned. However, the subtext of this appointment is important to keep in mind. If Joe died during the march, which he almost did from cholera, Hingepin Sidney Rigdon would be the right guy. Thus, the forgotten hero of Mormonism. Joe had blessed him with all the wisdom and the knowledge to preside over the church, and no other person had such a blessing given to them. Joe 3.0 wasn't even two years old when this blessing was given to Rigdon. So, I mean, he was in no place to lead the church if his father died in a firefight with the Missourians, even though he was the first surviving son and the right patrilineal heir. The idea of Joe 3.0 being his father's rightful successor was recognized by Hinchpin Sidney Rigdon during the succession crisis in 1844. Rigdon's claim to power hearkened to this 1834 blessing that Joe gave him, but that was to basically keep the presidency functioning as quote-unquote guardians of the church until Joe 3.0 came of age to lead the church. Basically, Rigdon would be a placeholder prophet until Joe 3.0 felt he was mature enough to gain the gift of the endowment of God to be the next prophet, seer, and revelator. Of course, Bloody Brigham Young's jealous advocacy for dissolution of the presidency upon the prophet's death was directly opposed to Rigdon's position as Rigdon posed the greatest legitimate threat to Bloody Brigham's power grab. Rigdon's position and influence in the church it had waned through the Nauvoo years, but he was running as Joe's vice presidential candidate during the 1844 election. So to some extent, Hinchpin Rigdon and Joe's relationship had been repaired by mid-1844. But Rigdon took an active role in fighting against Bloody Brigham's power grab. The public largely sided with Brigham after a demonstration that we'll discuss when it comes up in the historical timeline. But after that demonstration... Rigdon attempted to form his own church in opposition to Brigham and the Quorum of Apostles. As Quinn reports from his 1976 BYU Studies article, quote, Bitterly disappointed, Rigdon refused the offer of the apostles to continue functioning under their direction. The seriousness of Rigdon's position and the threat he represented in 1844 was indicated in the journal of one of the apostles, George A. Smith. Now quoting George A. Smith, quote, Tuesday, September 3rd. I learned Elder Rigdon was making a division in the church ordaining prophets, priests, and kings contrary to the say of God. The twelve visited him, and he said his authority was greater than ours, seemed determined to scatter the church and let up a party he claimed to have many visions and revelation. And at variance with those given President Joseph Smith, we labored with him until nine o'clock at night, and after deliberation, disfellowshipped him and sent elders Parley P. Pratt, Orson Hyde, Amasa Lyman to demand his license. He was angry. He said he would expose the councils of the church and publish all he knew against us. He knew the church had not been led by the spirit of God for a long time. End quote. Back to Quinn. 
Unable to tolerate Rigdon's schismatic activities, the Quorum of the Twelve prepared to excommunicate him. End quote. What I'm illustrating here is succession was anything but a clean transition of power in 1844. Rigdon had always had this 1834 ordination prior to Zion's camp to fall back on, but it clearly wasn't enough to sway the public opinion for, I mean, so many factors that we're going to have to explore in future episodes. But Rigdon's co-counselor in the presidency had been designated as Freddie G. Willie back in the 1833 revelation, but Freddie G. Willie died at two years before Joe died and the schism crisis was born. So the man who replaced Freddie G. Willie, that was William Law, the primary author of the Nauvoo Expositor, which catalyzed Joe and Hiram's deaths in the first place. Needless to say, Law wasn't in the proper place to lead the main body of Mormons alongside Rigdon until Joe 3.0 was old enough to inherit the mantle. The, I mean, Rigdon and Law never saw eye to eye to the point that they would be co-placeholder presidents of the church until Joe 3.0 was mature enough. However, this didn't stop Law from leading his own small schism of Mormonism for a very brief period before it was absorbed into much larger contingents of Mormons. Once again, another issue that we're going to explore in coming episodes. Now, rightful successors dying or being removed from good standing in the church had also affected the ordination of David Whitmer to be rightful successor when he was ordained in July of 1834, when Zion's camp reached, reached its destination in Jackson County, Missouri, from volume three of the history of the church, reporting a sermon that Joe gave in March of 1838, quote, President Joseph Smith Jr. gave a history of the ordination of David Whitmer, which took place in July 1834, to be a leader or a prophet to this church, which ordination was on condition that he, Joseph Smith Jr., did not live to see God himself, end quote. Now, this was all well and good when he gave this lecture in March of 18, 1838, but it in a mere month after this sermon, Joe N. Hinchpin Rigdon would write the Danite Manifesto charging David Whitmer, John Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery with apostasy, giving them 48 hours to vacate far west Missouri or they would get a visit from the Danites. D-Day David Whitmer was still alive when Joe died in 1844 and he used this 1834 ordination as his claim to power to lead his followers, colloquially referred to as the Whitmerites, until his death in 1888. D-Day David Whitmer and Hinchpin Rigdon weren't the only ones to receive a direct succession ordination prior to Joe's death. A major confounding player in all of this was a guy named James J. Strang. We'll be discussing James Strang extensively in coming episodes, but suffice it to say, Strang emerged after the death of Joe with a letter of succession ordination, which was dated the week before Joe was shot dead in Carthage jail. From the letter, quote, Behold, my servant James J. Strang hath come to thee from far truth when he knew it not, and hath not rejected it, but, but had... Uh, but hath had faith in thee, the shepherd and stone of Israel, and to him shall the gathering of the people be, for he shall plant a stake of Zion in Wisconsin, and I will establish it, and there shall my people have peace and rest, and shall not be moved. And it continues and continues. There's no punctuation. It's an incredibly hard letter to read, and it reads nothing like Joseph Smith wrote or dictated ever. Anyway. But Quinn continues with his assessment of this letter as follows, quote, Even at face value, the letter seemed to be no more than a local appointment, but Strang insisted the document designated him as Joseph's successor. Rather than presenting his claims to the church in Nauvoo, Strang announced his position at a conference of the church at Florence, Michigan on 5th August 1844. The presiding elder of that branch, Crandall Dunn, denounced the claim as an imposture and observed that the postmark on the envelope of Strang's letter proved it had been a forgery. Brigham Young, in 1846, denounced the entire letter as a forgery. Now, quoting Brigham, quote, Every person acquainted with Joseph Smith and his style of dictation and writing might readily know that he never wrote nor caused to be written that letter to Strang. Back to Quinn. 
Modern analysis of the documents have not only agreed with that verdict, but have also judged the signature of Joseph Smith on the letter to be a forgery. In addition to the letter, String also claimed that he had been ordained successor by an angel. Persisting in his claims, he was excommunicated by the branch at Florence, Michigan on 5th August 1844, an action that was repeated by the apostles at Nauvoo, end quote. Of course, Bloody Brigham called String's letter a forgery because James String was a huge threat, just like Hinchpin Cindy Rigdon and David Whitmer and a bunch of other guys. But regardless of his denunciation of String and String's excommunication from the church, String was a charismatic leader and was openly opposed to the practice of polygamy, which made him an appealing candidate and the leader of the second largest community of Mormons in the wake of the schism crisis until his assassination in 1856. Like I said, we're going to discuss Strang extensively in the future, but the point I'm making with introducing him into this discussion is that secretive ordinations of leaders in the church and designated successors made the problem of discerning Joe's true intent immensely challenging for the body of Mormons at large. Who do they follow when they have eight different people coming forward claiming that they're going to be the next prophet and the most reasonable next prophet, Joe 3.0, is only 11 years old at the time? This was a conundrum that held at the exaltation of every average Mormon in the balance of their own decision with who to follow. But other people had stronger claims to lead factions than James String with his forged letter. Lyman White is an interesting example of this. Immediately prior to Joe's death, Lyman White, the wild ram of the mountains, was tasked with taking a group of Mormons to settle in Texas. Bloody Brigham tried to recall White from his mission, but White directly opposed Bloody Brigham's decree because he was on a mission from God. Now, Lyman White wrote this, which I'm quoting once again from Quinn's BYU Studies article, quote, This revelation of the Lord was given by the angel of the seventh dispensation and was to continue during my life. It was given by the highest authority that then was, and I cannot see any use or benefit it could be to alter it, especially as there is no power on earth that can do it. My mission was to continue during my life, and as Joseph never found fault with me, and no other man has authority to do so, I think my case will lay over till the Lord takes me to himself. End quote. While this revelation doesn't explicitly state that Lyman White was to be an actual successor, it does show that White understood that he wasn't beholden to the power claims of Bloody Brigham and the Quorum of Twelve. However, this revelation was given to Lyman White in secret, which, which constitutes a central issue of many of these ordinations for succession and leadership. The church was supposed to operate by common consent. Members were supposed to vote on changes in leadership and for canonizing revelations to become church scripture. But Joe had abandoned that practice as the church grew and became less homogenous. He operated more of the church in the shadows as his ministry aged. But... If Joe blessed one guy with being the rightful successor and only three other guys were in the room at the same time, as soon as Joe died and that guy came forward saying that he's supposed to be the next prophet, what reason did the public have to believe him? James String was one of the earliest to claim this secretive succession and therefore garnered the largest following aside from the Quorum of Apostles. But another of these came from Alpheus Cutler, who was a member since 1833, whereas James Strang, of course, only appeared on the scene in 1844. But Alpheus Cutler was, you know, he was a guy who was born before the Constitution of the United States was ratified. Cutler formed his branch after briefly following the Quorum of Apostles to Iowa when he spoke of a secretive ordination. This is once again from Quinn's BYU article, quote, Joseph Smith, some time prior to his death, organized a quorum of seven, all of whom were ordained under his hand to the prophetic office, with all the rights, keys, powers, privileges, and blessings belonging to that condition. The only difference in the ordinations of the seven was in the case of Alpheus Cutler, whose right to act as prophet, seer, and revelator was to be in force upon the whole world from that very hour. Under this ordination, he claimed an undisputed right to organize and build the, up the kingdom the same as Joseph had done, end quote. 
Now, this Quorum of Seven is something which hasn't actually survived in the Brighamite tradition of the church to this day, but is frequently used by many fundamentalist groups with various names, including like the Council of Friends, the Council of Seven, the Holy Council of Friends, and dozens of other names. When Joe supposedly formed this Quorum of Seven, the leadership of the church was in constant flux, as it could have only come in the late spring of 1844 as chaos continued to unfold politically, religiously, and socially for the Mormons. But, once again, Cutler's claim to rightful succession was in competition with half a dozen others in 1844 through 48, and he only gained a relatively small following because his ordination was secretive to begin with and was never announced from the pulpit for public approval for voting on common consent. Now, Oliver Cowdery, Ollie Cowdung as we call him, he was absent during the succession crisis because he had been excommunicated and removed from the body of Mormons back in 1838. However, Ollie was described for the Book of Mormon. He was the second elder of the church, and he was one of the three witnesses to the plates. He was royalty who'd been cast aside when his personal opinions about the sanctity of marriage conflicted with Joe's and his alliance with the Whitmerites represented the greatest threat to Joe's power in Missouri in 1838. However, Ollie had been ordained as quote unquote associate president to the church in December of 1834 after Joe's return from Zion's camp when he was conceiving of the first massive structural organizational shift in the church, adding the Quorum of the Twelve, the two Quorums of the Seventies, and creating dozens of other auxiliary leadership and middle management positions. What was associate president? Well, it didn't matter much because Oliver Cowdery was the only one who was titled associate president, and he was exiled by 1844 when the question could actually be answered. But according to Quinn, quote, Cowdery's minutes of his ordination indicate that he was not merely made an assistant whose role was to subordinate to the first and second counselors in the first presidency from Cowdery himself, quote, the office of assistant president is to assist in presiding over the whole church and to officiate in the absence of the president, according to his rank and appointment, viz. President Cowdery first, President Rigdon second, and President Williams third. That's, of course, Ollie Cowdery, uh, Hinge Pin Sidney Rigdon, and Freddie G. Willey third. As they were severally called, the office of this priesthood is also to act as spokesman, taking Aaron for an ensample. End quote. Back to Quinn. Although introduced as a member of the first presidency after Rigdon and Williams, Cowdery was given supremacy over them. In fact, the definition of his powers gave Cowdery joint control with the prophet. In the absence of Joseph Smith, Cowdery was president, and the first and second counselors were his counselors. End quote. Ollie was a great candidate for next prophet if Joe had died in like 1835 or 36, as he was essentially co president with Joe. But because Ollie was estranged, he was nowhere near viable during the actual succession crisis in 1844. Another possible path of succession could have gone towards the patriarch of the church. The way the Brighamite church is structured today is that each stake, you know, local authority area, has their own patriarch who gives patriarchal blessings. Patriarchal blessings are essentially a rite of passage for Mormons, usually undertaken in their teens. But the office of patriarch in Joe's church was wildly different than the office today. The first person called in 1833 to be patriarch was literally Joe's patriarch, Joseph Smith Sr., Big Daddy Cheese. He hasn't come up in our timeline in a long time. Big Daddy Cheese was given a monthly stipend and a per-blessing fee for giving patriarchal blessings to members. He gave hundreds, many of which have survived and have been archived by church genealogists. Big Daddy Cheese died in September of 1840, and he conferred his office of patriarch of the church, sorry, patriarch, yeah, no, that's right, patriarch of the church, not patriarch to the church, patriarch of the church, father of the church, that's what it says. So he conferred his office of patriarch of the church to Hiram sidekick Abiff Smith. Joe said of this event in May of 1843, quote, 
The patriarchal office is the highest office in the church. And Father Smith conferred this office on Hiram Smith on his deathbed. End quote. Soon after this public declaration, Joe said in June of 1843, less than a month before the polygamy revelation was given, quote, Hiram Smith should hold the office of prophet to the church as it was his birthright, end quote. This is pretty tough to work with because Big Daddy Cheese was never in a position above his son, Joe, in the church. The office of patriarch didn't actually hold much real authority. It was a purely revelatory role in that the duty of the patriarch is to give blessings to parishioners. But the actual role of the presiding patriarch had evolved in the short four years that Hiram had been presiding patriarch. Big Daddy Cheese's role in the church was merely advisory and then giving people blessings until his death in 1840. However, Hiram, on the other hand, was an active participant in the decision-making process of the church. He received his own revelations. He had taken plural wives, and he was completely inseparable from his younger brother. So Joe declaring that Hiram holds the office of prophet to the church and that, that uh, his office is his birthright in the church, as was Hiram's birthright, meant that the presiding patriarch wasn't, it wasn't just an emeritus auxiliary role to the leadership of the church. It was an executive leadership position. Even the name of the office invokes that of a father, one who holds some level of dominion over the church within this theology. And Hiram exercised his role as a patriarch, a father of the church. Upon Hiram and Joe's death, Samuel Harrison Smith, their youngest brother, followed them to the grave only a month later. Crazy Willie Smith was the last surviving Smith brother who jealously advocated for a strong role in the church leadership that Bloody Brigham was slowly forming with the Quorum of Apostles at the head. Bloody Brigham quashed Crazy Willie's moves and usurped his power by neutering the office of presiding patriarch. This wasn't hard for Bloody Brigham to do because... Crazy Willie wasn't held in the highest regard by most of the church, especially with, you know, previously owning a brothel in Nauvoo and openly advocating for the practice of spiritual wifery. People didn't like him. Plus, Joe and Crazy Willie had a couple of very public spats, which included physical encounters, and that cast a cloud of doubt over Crazy Willie being level-headed enough to be in any powerful role of the church. The primary avenue of succession, which was actually exploited by Bloody Brigham during the crisis, was the Council of Fifty. Now, we've discussed the council extensively, and it's going to continue to play a larger and more occupying role in our timeline. But suffice it to say, the Council of Fifty or the Council of YTFIF, Council of Yitfif, if you listen to Latter-day Lesbian podcast, that was the government that Joe established to replace the American government when he finally took it over. All of the Quorum of Apostles were members of the Council of Fifty. Now, keep in mind, the Council of Fifty continued to meet with Bloody Brigham often as chairperson after Joe's death. Bloody Brigham was usually the guy calling the shots and giving advice in the council meetings, which he used to slowly move the leadership in degrees towards favoring him as the rightful president and to follow his decision-making. Apparently, a speech that Joe made during a certain meeting of the Council of Fifty led some members to believe that he was designating the council as a whole to be the rightful successor in the event of his death or absence. This quote that Joseph Smith supposedly gave comes from a guy named Benjamin F. Johnson. And I'm going to read this directly from Quinn's paper in a moment. But first, a bit of a precursor on Benjamin F. Johnson so we can understand this quote in proper context. Benjamin F. Johnson was one of the youngest, possibly the youngest member of the Council of Fifty at age 26. He was the youngest member of the Army of Israel during the Missouri Mormon War of 1838, and he participated actively in the raids of the non-Mormon settlements. He even helped to bury and later unearth a cannon that the Mormons stole from the Missouri militia, and he was taken prisoner and released by the Missourians for a brief period. He was also an early practitioner of polygamy, and Joe married Johnson's older sister, Delcina, 
while Benjamin F. Johnson officiated the ceremony sometime in the spring of 1842. My point is, Benjamin F. Johnson was totally in the faith, and he was a firebrand who zealously fought for the cause of building the kingdom of God on earth. Now, to put this guy into context, because it's always fun to get a little story from these people, there's an apocryphal, self-reported story from Benjamin F. Johnson's life reminiscence, which we'll discuss that in a second. And this is about when he was a prisoner in the Missouri militia. According to Johnson, a Missouri mobocrat, a Missouri militiaman, put a pistol to little Ben's head and said, you give up Mormonism right now or I'll shoot you. Because that's how stuff like that worked, right? It wasn't tell us where Joseph Smith is or tell us where you hid the cannon and the rifles that you stole from us. No, it was a death threat for him to renounce his religion. Johnson said that he apparently refused to renounce the faith and that the guy pulled the trigger, but the gun misfired. Then the guy cursed the gun, which had never misfired in 20 years, and then he primed it again with a new priming cap and attempted to shoot Johnson again, and the gun again misfired. It happened a third time when another Missourian told him to fix his gun and then, quote, you can kill the cuss all right, end quote. Then this Missouri militiaman, mobocrat, tried to shoot Benjamin Johnson a fourth and final time, at which point the gun exploded in the guy's hand and killed the assailant, leaving Johnson completely unharmed. Another Missourian, the guy who told him to go clean his gun and then try to shoot him, who apparently just watched his friend die by his own gun exploding in his hand, apparently quipped, quote, you'd better not try to kill that man, end quote. So does Benjamin F. Johnson sound like a trustworthy source to you, dear listener? <laughs> so with that story in mind and knowing a little bit about this guy's background, Benjamin F. Johnson recalled a specific meeting of the Council of 50 in his memoir titled My Life's Review, which he dictated sometime before his death while he was in the Brigamine tradition. But for some reason or another, his reminiscence wasn't published until 1947. So... This meeting that he remembered where Joe designated the Council of 50 as the rightful successor in case he died was remembered by Benjamin F. Johnson probably 50 to 60 years after the meeting actually happened and the account wasn't published until more than 100 years after the meeting. That's my way of saying this account is questionable and even that is being generous. Quote, at one of the last meetings of the Council of Fifty, after all had been completed and the keys of power committed, and in the presence of the Quorum of Twelve and others who were encircled around him, he arose, gave a review of his life and sufferings and of the testimonies he had borne, and said that the Lord had now accepted his labors and sacrifices, and did not require him any longer to carry the responsibilities and burden and bearing off of this kingdom, and turning to those around him, including the Twelve, he said, now apparently quoting Joseph Smith, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now place it upon you, my brethren of the council, and I shake my skirts clear of all responsibility from this time forth, springing from the floor and shaking his skirt at the same time. End quote. Joseph Smith apparently liked to wear skirts in his Council of Fifty meetings. Once again, I mean, this was given, this was published more than a hundred years after the meeting happened. It was remembered probably 50 to 60 years after the event occurred by somebody who was in his mid 20s at the time. How well do you remember the exact details of what somebody said to you from 50 years ago when you were in your mid 20s? Do we have any listeners who are in their 70s? I mean, still, I, the thing is, it's completely absurd to believe that this is an accurate recounting of what happened here, right? And Quinn goes on to point out a, a, a detail within the historical record that various church leaders acted in accordance with this line of thinking, even if Benjamin's recounting of this event simply can't be trusted. Quote, Following the death of Joseph Smith, the apostles almost immediately referred to his remarks on this occasion as indicating the right of the Quorum of the Twelve to govern the church in his absence. Nevertheless, the kingdom of God in Mormonism was both ecclesiastical and temporal. The keys to the kingdom rested upon the shoulders of the Council of Fifty, which included the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. In 1846, Brigham Young stated, back to Quinn, 
Thus, it is not strange that some members of the Council of Fifty regarded that body as having a right of succession to lead and organize the church. End quote. But also consider this. Each and every one of those members of the Quorum of Apostles and the Council of Fifty had vested interests in making sure the power publicly shifted to the Quorum. All of them had internal and external motivating factors, making them act in accordance with Bloody Brigham's 40-year vision of taking power and moving the Mormons to Mexico. He was to be the sole religious authority. There was, however, some almost sort of tenuous scriptural precedence that the Quorum of Apostles were equal in authority to the prophet in the way that the three branches of government are equal in power in theory, even if in practice there is some disparity. Section 3 of the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants is titled On Priesthood, and it was given in April of 1835, right before printing uh, of the 1835 edition began. This was included as Section 3, presumably because it would be one of the earliest sections read by any new readers. It begins by creating two different priesthoods, the Aaronic and the Melchizedek, which was unknown before this revelation was printed and read by Mormons. The section continues to lay out the leadership structure of the church and the duties of the various offices. So this is part of verse 11 in the 1835 edition, or verses 21 through 26 of the modern Doctrine and Covenants section 107. Now, as I read this, you'll find what I mean when it's set up similar to the government with three co-equal branches of ruling power, the presidency, the quorum of 12 apostles, and the quorum of 70. Here we go. Quote, of necessity, there are presidents or presenting offices growing out of or appointed of or from among those who are ordained to the several offices in these two priesthoods. Of the Melchizedek priesthood, three presiding high priests chosen by the body, appointed and ordained to that office, and upheld by the confidence, faith, and prayer of the church, form a quorum of the presidency of the church. Boom. There's our first one. That's the first quorum of the presidency. Three high priests with the Melchizedek priesthood are chosen and appointed and ordained of that office. That would be Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Frederick G. Williams. Okay. Now here's the next part. The 12 traveling counselors are called to be the 12 apostles or special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world, thus differing from other officers in the church in the duties of their calling. And they form a quorum equal in authority and power to the three presidents previously mentioned. Boom. Got your second one. We got, the presidency, now we got the quorum of 12. That's number one, number two. Here's number three. The 70 are also called to preach the gospel and to be especial witnesses unto the Gentiles and in all the world, thus differing from other officers in the church in these duties of their calling, and they form a quorum equal in authority to that of the 12 especial witnesses or apostles just named. Boom. Got your third one. Three co-equal branches of government in the church. And it continues. And every decision made by either of these quorums must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decisions in order to make their decisions of the same power or validity one with another, end quote. So none of this simple or major majority uh, <laughs> structures, uh, two thirds majority, no, you know, 50%, 51% majority. It's straight up unanimous. Unanimous is the only way that these three co-equal branches of church government can operate beginning in 1835. The presidency as one quorum, the apostles as a second quorum, and the quorum of the 70s as the third and all three co-equal branches. Now, it should be no mystery what Joe had in mind as a 30-year plan for the United States when we read this revelation in the context of his military campaign and general lawlessness of the previous four years of, of his ministry when this was given. But at the end of the day, Bloody Brigham's power grab was successful. We'll discuss the subtle and overt movements Brigham made in the coming succession crisis on this podcast, but suffice it to say, he was successful in his successorship. As Quinn states in his BYU Studies article, which, of course, you'll find in the show notes, quote, The Quorum of Apostles was a known and a trusted entity to the Mormons. As early as 27th March, 1836, the apostles had been sustained with the first presidencies as, quote, prophets and seers, end quote. With their prophet dead and mobs menacing Nauvoo, the Quorum of the Twelve seemed to be the only stability upon which Mormons could depend. 
After 8th August 1844, the church emerged from its crisis. An unsettled mode of succession could have destroyed it. The Quorum of Twelve was determined that such a crisis should never be repeated. The apostles were careful, however, to specify that the place of Joseph Smith would never be fulfilled by another. In an epistle of the Quorum of the Twelve to the church on 15th August 1844, they stated, quote, let no man presume for a moment that his, Joseph Smith's, place will be filled by another, for remember he stands in his own place and always will. Back to Quinn. When the membership of the church voted on 8th August to accept the Twelve Apostles as the first presidency of the church, they were not voting for a successor to Joseph Smith. The Mormons were simply acknowledging the fact that the Quorum of the Twelve presided over the church by virtue of known revelation and by the recognized ascendance given to them by the founding prophet. Nevertheless, by virtue of his being president and senior member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, Brigham Young was already acting as president of the LDS Church. As early as 5th December 1844, Brigham Young signed himself in a letter as, quote, pressed president of the Church of LDS, end quote. Moreover, the manuscript minutes of the General Conference on 7th April 1845 show that Brigham Young was unanimously voted upon and sustained as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to this church and nation and all nations, and also as the president of the whole Church of Latter-day Saints. In pursuance of this mandate, Brigham Young, on 8th May 1845, wrote Wilford Woodruff, then in England, to obtain foreign copyrights to church publications in the name of Brigham Young, President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And on 15th August 1845, he gave identical instructions to others for the securing of U.S. copyrights to church publications, end quote. By early to mid 1845, Bloody Brigham's power grab was complete through pressures within his control and capitalization on forces outside of his control. It was soon after this in the Great Basin, Mexico, when Brigham approached Wilford Woodruff and asked his counseling on whether a separate presidency should be formed as presiding over the Quorum of Apostles, which was eventually done, removing some power from the Quorum of Apostles and consolidating it into the three-man first presidency who operated as an autonomous body above the control of the apostles. The apostles from that time forward would become an advisory committee to the presidency instead of the presidency being three selected men within the quorum of 12 having equal authority as the other nine members. The overall takeaway is that the current succession structure used by the church has no solid foundation in scripture, just inferential basis in a mishmash of a few cherry picked scriptures and private statements made by Joseph Smith, some of which were remembered long after his death by people who were in leadership positions in the Utah church who had vested interests. Now, some would claim that a few of those statements were fabricated out of whole cloth to post hoc justify bloody Brigham's tenure as president which is a completely reasonable assessment. But the major point baked into this takeaway is that the succession process of the Brighamite Church today is directly counter to the scriptural precedent the Book of Mormon, the Lectures on Faith, and the Pearl of Great Price instruct of patrilineal succession, which began this whole conversation at the top of the episode when Joseph Smith III was designated as the rightful successor. The Book of Mormon especially is the most egregious example of the leadership of Brigham's church willfully ignoring scripture to retain their own tenuous grasp on power. Given the entire body of Mormon scripture and the basis for Joseph Smith's theology, Joseph Smith III is the rightful successor and the true holder of the keys to the kingdom. And of course I say that in scare quotes. Understandably, for a religion so focused on authority and this ethereal concept of specific people holding keys given by biblical prophets and apostles, to the question of who, old, who actually holds the keys of the kingdom and thereby the authority of the church, that's a hotly disputed subject. It always has been. Almost every fragment of the hundreds of factions of Mormonism began with a dispute among leadership about who holds the keys. 
So now we move briefly to Quinn's second article up for discussion today, Joseph Smith III's 1844 Blessing and the Mormons of Utah. This is from the John Whitmer Journal, Volume 1 of 1981, and the heading is rather interesting. Here is just the heading from it. Quote, The discovery of the Thomas Bullock transcript of Joseph Smith III's blessing by his father has created much discussion among Latter-day Saint historians. D. Michael Quinn has previously undertaken a major study of the succession issue, the Mormon Succession Crisis of 1844, BYU Studies, Winter 1976, that's the article we just read, and was asked by the editors of the John Whitmer Historical Association Journal to prepare an article on the blessing's historical significance to the Mormons. It's a quite an interesting quote, isn't it? That's the heading to this article that was written by the editor of the John Whitmer Journal. Here's the first paragraph, quote, Members of the Mormon Church, headquartered in Salt Lake City, may have reacted anywhere along the spectrum from sublime indifference to temporary discomfiture to cold terror at the recently discovered blessing by Joseph Smith Jr. to young Joseph on the 17th January 1844 to, quote, be my successor to the presidency of the high priesthood, a seer and a revelator and a prophet unto the church, which appointment belongeth to him by blessing and also by right, end quote. Now, Quinn, that's that's a quote from this recently discovered letter uh, from Thomas Bullock, a uh, transcription of Joseph Smith III's blessing. Notably, Thomas Bullock was the guy who was the scribe that gave it to us uh, one of the – or the most widely used version of the King Follett Discourse. He was a scribe for just a brief time for Joseph Smith, but also extensively under the rule of Brigham Young. Now. This is where Quinn goes on to uh, describe or to discuss the importance of this letter, uh, of this transcription within the context of a rightful successorship that we have discussed on the podcast today so far, as well as the authenticity of this recently discovered letter in 1981. Quote, the Mormon Church follows a line of succession from Joseph Smith Jr. completely different from that provided in this document. To understand the significance of the 1844 document in relation to the LDS Church and Mormon claims of presidential succession from Joseph Smith Jr., one must recognize the authenticity and provenance of the document itself. The statements and actions by Joseph Smith about the succession before 1844, the succession developments at Nauvoo after January 1844, and the nature of apostolic succession begun by Brigham Young and continued in the LDS Church today. All internal evidences concerning the manuscript blessing of Joseph Smith III dated 17th January 1844 give conclusive support to its authenticity, end quote. Let's briefly pause there. Historical support for the authenticity of a document doesn't prove it is indeed authentic. It merely creates the historical model with which the document fits. Quinn continues, quote, even though Joseph had ordained four other men before 1844 to succeed him and had given the Quorum of the Twelve administrative authority over the church equal to the First Presidency, it is obvious that Joseph Smith intended his son, Joseph Smith III, to one day become president of the LDS Church. A revelation to Joseph Smith Jr. given a month after the birth of young Joseph on 6th November 1832 stated that the priesthood, quote, must needs remain through you and... Joseph Smith, and your lineage until the restoration of all things, end quote. Back to Quinn. And the revelation on priesthood and church officers of 19th January 1841 also stated, quote, Even so I say unto my servant Joseph, in thee and in thy seed shall the nations of the earth be blessed, end quote. The pure Smith blood. That's what it all boils down to, the pure Mormon Smith blood. Continuing with Quinn. Prior to this, Joseph had already advanced to be general authorities in the church. His father, his brothers Hiram and William, his uncle John, his aunt's first cousin Amasa M. Lyman, his first cousin George A. Smith, and his acknowledged fourth cousin Willard Richards, fifth cousin Heber C. Kimball, and sixth cousins Brigham Young, Parley Pratt, and Orson Pratt. <laughs> they're all related. They're all related. They're all <laughs> not only are they friends, they're all related to each other. <laughs> Uh, one more line from Quinn here. Joseph was making the Mormon hierarchy an extended family, and there can be no reason to doubt that he had every intention of his son serving at the apex one day, end quote. 
Nepotism in early Mormonism was one of the strongest running themes of the church. It was, indeed, the church of the Smith family and their extended relatives. And Quinn puts it so succinctly that, quote, there can be no reasonable doubt that Joseph had every intention of his son serving at the apex of this institution one day, end quote, right? This is simply unequivocally true. Keep in mind, D. Michael Quinn was a BYU professor when he wrote this. He was employed by the university run by the Brighamite Church when this document surfaced in 1981 that the Brighamite Church has absolutely no grounds for rightful succession after the death of Joseph Smith. This blessing completely shatters any pretense that any other church than the RLDS was to be the one true church after Joe's death. Joe 3.0 was the person in Joe's mind all along that would be the next prophet to lead this dispensation. This entire Quinn 1981 JWHA article is absolutely remarkable. You'll find a link to it in the show notes. Now, his concluding paragraph summarizes the complexity of the issue in typical Quinn-esque, forthright, understandable way. He leaves his readers to make their own conclusion and simply sticks with critical observations based on the data. Quote, there were many complexities and contradictions in the 14-year ministry of Joseph Smith as president of the LDS Church. Not only did he establish competing claims of individual succession to his office at the same time, which we've discussed this whole episode, that's been the focus of this entire episode, but with reference to polygamy in particular, Joseph Smith's public statements were moving in opposite directions from his private ministry. Brigham Young resolved the inconsistencies by adhering to the private instructions Joseph Smith, the prophet, gave in the name of the Lord during the last years of his life, and by dismissing the public inconsistencies as diplomatic concealment. Joseph Smith III resolved the inconsistencies by adhering to the public instructions published by Joseph Smith's authority during his lifetime, and by dismissing the secret developments at Nauvoo as aberrations. Both positions required rationalization or denial of discordant elements of the past. Both the Mormons of Utah and the Saints of the Reorganization were loyal to their conceptions of Joseph Smith's prophetic office, and from their differing viewpoints, the recently discovered 1844 blessing of Joseph Smith III verified either the tragedy of unfulfilled prophetic office or the glory of a martyr's heritage." End quote. Now, the only issue here is that this letter was a forgery by the infamous Mark Hoffman. Mark Hoffman made this blessing as one example within his document Forging Empire and exhibited it to the world of Mormon history as one of the greatest document finds in all of Mormon history of the 20th century. We discussed this near the end of part two of the three-part series on Mark Hoffman, and that was back in August and September of 2016 of the podcast. And it feels particularly relevant because this is when the importance of this Joseph Smith the Third Blessing document fits into the historical timeline. And I'm also recording this podcast 34 years, almost to the day, after Mark Hoffman murdered two people to cover up his fraud. If you want the Mark Hoffman story near the current anniversary of his most infamous acts, consider going back to the podcast backlog and listening to that three-part series. There are some of our most highest downloaded episodes. But Hoffman knew how important this document was to the RLDS Church. This Joseph Smith III blessing designated Joseph Smith III as the proper successor to the Mormon mantleship. He also knew the LDS Church would want to buy this document for the purpose of destroying or suppressing it, as they had done with many of his forgeries. So he pitted the two religions against each other in hopes of getting the best bid from one of the two and making off with a sweet exchange or with a big bag of money. Notably, in a rare moment, Mark Hoffman recorded his phone call with the RLDS archivist when he pitched her the blessing in exchange for a nearly priceless artifact. I played this audio on the Mark Hoffman episode number two back in September 2016, but I'm going to play it again here. Fair warning, the audio is just under six minutes and it's really terrible quality. So here's the content of the phone call for those of you who skip it or who need to understand what you're about to hear before you listen to it. It begins with Mark introducing himself to Madeline Brunson calling from Salt Lake City. Madeline Brunson, of course, the RLDS archivist. 
Then he tells Madeline that he came across an interesting manuscript and describes what it is, the dating of it, where he found it among the Thomas Bullock papers, and the analysis from then church historian Dean Jesse. You can hear Madeline Brunson's surprise. He then reads the content of the blessing, which designates Joseph Smith III as the rightful successor of the church from generation to generation, calling him to be seer and revelator. Then you hear Madeline say, oh, for heaven's sake, in, re in reaction to the content. And you hear some of the Sunstone audience laugh because that's where this audio was actually played and where I'm getting the audio for, audio for this. Of course, you'll find a link in the show notes to the entire Sunstone presentation where this audio was played if you want to listen to the entire presentation uh, by George Thorpe Morton and Steve Mayfield. So after this, you hear Madeline asking about the pedigree of the document once Mark asks if she might be interested in it. Then he drops the bomb, pun intended, of what he's willing to exchange for it, a first edition Book of Commandments, which were trading for just shy of half a million dollars in the 1980s. Now, to put the Book of Commandments in today's money context to understand how big of an ask this was for just a single document... There's currently a trade being facilitated among a couple of Mormon rare document collectors today, which includes David Whitmer's copy of the Book of Mormon he used when he was writing his 1880s book, An Address to All Believers in Christ, which also includes um, his most well-known seer stone. So this package, which includes his Book of Commandments and his seer stone, along with a few other loose documents, is about to trade hands for $5 million. Okay. So Mark offering to trade the Joe 3.0 blessing that he made in his basement for an original book of commandments was quite the interesting proposition, which is why you'll hear Madeline Brunson say, oh my, and sheepishly chuckle when he makes the ask. The audio ends with him providing Madeline Brunson with his contact info, and this is all in all about six minutes of audio. So feel free to skip it uh, if you'd like. Um because now you know the contents of what you're about to hear. But here it is. Hello, this is my Rothman calling from Salt Lake City. Oh, yeah. Uh, you may remember me that I have a chance to get to this. Okay, the reason I'm calling is I just came across uh, interesting manuscripts that I thought that the real nice church might be interested in. Uh -huh. It's a uh, left thing that was given to Joseph Smith III by his father. It's dated January 17th, 1844, and it's in, according to Dean Jesse, it's in the handwriting of uh, Bullock, Thomas Bullock. So, shall I use it to speak back? This is an original? Yes, this is an original copy. What did you find it? Well, it was amongst the um, Thomas Bullock papers uh -huh. that were still in the hands of his descendants up in Colville, Colville, Utah. Okay, now, when was that? Pieces. This is the last thing to deliver to the third? That's right. On January 25th? January 17th. 1844. 1844. Uh-huh. By your father? Yes. Uh, I have a written statement also from Dean Jesse saying that it's his opinion it's in Thomas Fuller's handwriting. Uh-huh. Okay. So, yeah, okay, let me hear it. Uh -huh. And you see, it's here that this is the title I'm reporting. A blessing given to Joseph Smith III by his father, Joseph Smith Jr., on January 17th, 1844. And this is the blessing. Uh -huh. Blessed of the Lord is my son Joseph, who is called the third. For the Lord loves the integrity of his heart, and loves him because of his faith and righteous desires. And for this cause has the Lord raised him up, that the promises made to the fathers might be fulfilled, even that the anointing of the progenitor shall be upon the head of my son, and his seed after him from generation to generation. For he shall be my successor to the presidency of the high priesthood, a seer and a revelator, and a prophet unto the church, which appointment belongeth to him by blessing, and also by right. Thirdly, I say the Lord, if he abides in me, his day shall be lengthened upon the earth. But if he abides out of me, I, the Lord, will receive him in an instant unto myself. 
when he is long, he shall be a strength to his brother and a comfort to his mother. Angels will minister unto him, and he will be wafted as on eagles' wings to be as wise as serpents. Even a most specific blessing shall be his. Amen. Uh, on the back of it, uh, there's also a date, the same day, January 17, 1841, by the same day, and a notation, which he just he wasn't sure about because there's not enough words, but he said, find her out of Joseph Smith's own hand. And the notation reads, Joseph Smith, free blessing. Joseph Smith, what? And then there's the, just written out a, a three. So Joseph Smith, three, um, uh-huh. um, oh, <laughs> so be in this interested in Well, sure, I uh, uh, can we get a copy of that Well, actually, what I was hoping was that you'd be interested in the original. the importance of this Joseph Smith, the third blessing from his father, just months before Joseph's death. The existence of an actual letter is still unknown. Maybe this letter, the, the actual transcription from the blessing exists locked away in some vault. Maybe it's in somebody's attic. Maybe it's in a private collection. Maybe it was destroyed or maybe it was never recorded in the first place. Or maybe it never happened point still remains this blessing to joseph smith iii is the single greatest explicit claim to succession the rlds had and it's firmly rooted in the deepest theology of the mormon religion the bloody brighamite tradition simply has no explicit theological or scriptural basis for their claims to succession authority should a blessing come forward where joe explicitly designated joe 3.0 to be the rightful successor that would completely shatter any pretense to authority and authenticity the majority of Mormon religions claim. The possession of the keys to the kingdom of God, whatever that means, in this dispensation had to be passed from Peter, James, and John, then through Elijah, and Moses, and Aaron in the Kirtland Temple to Joseph Smith, and then explicitly passed from one person to the next to get to the leadership today. If there was ever a break in that line of succession, in that chain from Joseph Smith to Russell M. Nelson, the whole system is illegitimate within the context of Mormon theology. And then, of course, every Mormon will leave the religion, right? Uh, Well, at, at the end of the day, 
Mark Hoffman was a genius for pitting these two religions against each other with this forged blessing because it taps into the very roots of what makes Mormonism Mormonism. This is something which only matters to people who choose to place a value judgment on the priesthood and a literal descent. Outsiders like yours truly can sit back and laugh at the pretzels that historians and apostles twisted themselves into in order to explain away the conflicts arising from patrilineal succession and what Bloody Brigham did. Mark Hoffman was a genius because he created documents that were within the context of the understood academic field of Mormon history. The dude knew his stuff. His forgeries weren't fabricated out of whole cloth. That would give away the gag and he wouldn't have made any money. What that really means is the scholarship surrounding a blessing being given to Joe 3.0 from his father designating Joe 3.0 to be the next prophet is rock solid, even if the document itself was a forgery. That's why it passed as legitimate for six years before the extent of Hoffman's forgeries was understood. Now, this whole conversation and the whole everything we've discussed in the podcast today begs the question of authority. What even is authority and power in the Mormon context? Now, I remember a presentation given by Steve Shields at Sunstone last year where he ran through seven of the major schisms coming out of the crisis of 1844. And I've told the story on the podcast before, I believe. Uh, bear with me if you've heard this before. But in the presentation, he went through multiple letter exchanges from various church leaders of various Mormon factions, most of which these letters were just calling into question the power and authority by which the other person had the right to be prophet and president of their respective congregations. In the Q&A, I got up and asked something to the effect of where does the power and authority actually come from? And Steve's answer was that he didn't have an answer, but that he looked forward to my paper on the subject. I laughed and thanked him for taking my question, but there really is a fundamental question at the root of my superficial question that couldn't be answered in a 10 minute Q and a, and probably couldn't ever be answered. The presentation and Steve's answer to my question caused me to think about this a lot. What is power and authority in Mormonism? And I've come to a few levels of understanding about this. First off, power is a real thing. And people in power have authority and therefore control over parts of the world and groups of people, whether we agree with or abide by that power and authority or not. Personally, I believe the climate disaster on the very short horizon is going to kill millions of people and displace hundreds of millions of people. But certain people in power with authority don't see that as an important issue or don't allow critical voices on the subject to be heard in certain parts of the world. I don't agree with their power and authority, but they have power over the lives of billions of people, myself included, so it doesn't matter what I do or don't agree with. Power equals influence. A person who can influence others has power over them, and that power extends beyond those they influence to spheres where they don't have direct but indirect influence. From where does that power and influence originate? Now that's a fantastic question. Most often people are born into a caste or society where they have more influence and power based on like their last name or the caste in which they were born. Uh, in Joseph Smith's case, he was one of those radical charismatics who realized that the best way to be in charge is to take charge and jealously guard that power once it's acquired. Now, each and every one of these factions of Mormonism has power and authority over the people who adhere to the specific system. They all agree that the keys of the priesthood and leadership in the religion, that those are important subjects, but they simply disagree on the most correct system to follow to get to who should be the person who holds those keys and powers of priesthood. It's the same end, but different ways to that end which leads to different people with power and authority over different groups because the individual structures are largely the same, but the people within those leadership structures are unique. These systems perpetuate simply because people continue to adhere to them through tacit agreement that their system of belief is superior to any other. My system gets me to the most awesome heaven, all other systems be damned. That's the mentality, right? But what stuns me about this story with the succession crisis and the Mark Hoffman forgery is that, by and large, p 
people didn't leave Mormonism because Mark Hoffman forged this Joseph Smith 3.0 blessing and the blessing came forward. All right. It's <laughs> this blessing was such a niche subject of Mormon history that only a few thousand people actually understood the historical significance of the letter. And then it cast into question uh, the entire lineal descendancy and the power authority structure of the LDS church and all of the other churches with Mormonism at their roots. Mormon history. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's such a niche subject, right? This only had significant historical significance to, I mean, to people who by and large had harmonized prickly issues of history long before this letter emerged. I mean, I guess, okay, so sure, there may be some people who read the Deseret News headline about this blessing in 1981, and maybe their faith was shaken. Maybe a few hundred people left. Maybe even a few thousand people left the church because of this letter. But the impact this letter had was so negligible when the Brighamite church had like 5 million people at the time. So what if a few hundred or a few thousand people leave? This letter and the whole Mark Hoffman issue was a scandal of epic historical proportions that occupied the entire decade of 1980 in the Mormon church. But the fact of the matter is when an institution has no grounding in reality and it reaches a certain critical mass, it can weather any scandal. Joseph Smith learned that fact during his ministry and the church knows it today when your system is built on lies, just lie until people stop asking questions. And that is going to do it for the episode today. Welcome back to the Historical Timeline episodes, everybody. Uh, it feels really good to be back into the regular swing of things instead of doing, you know, interviews and special editions and presentations and stuff. It feels good to be back into the regular, uh, the, I don't, I don't want to say grind. That sounds like it's tough to get through. I thoroughly enjoy it. I, I enjoy it so much. It's, um, here, better way of saying it, it's bad. It's good to be back wandering through the field of dreams of Mormon history. So let's, uh, real quick, we don't have any new patrons. Uh, we unfortunately did have a pledge deletion, which leaves us at a uh, negative two bucks from last episode. So if you want to pledge to support the show, uh, financially give your hard earned money to me in order to help fund the research that goes into this show, please do so over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, where you get access to a ton of extra content, including extended editions of every new episode, as well as our name of book club. We're reading through Mormonism unveiled the first quote unquote anti Mormon book. And it's a barrel of laughs to get through that book. Uh, also patron supporters of this show. If you're listening to this episode on the patron exclusive feed, you're going to hear a little detail about me stopping off at Cody's house, my co-researcher in the Smith Antheogen theory, on my drive back uh, to Seattle from L.A. I have a fun little story for everybody. Uh, so if you are on the patron exclusive feed, be sure to tune in to the extended edition of this episode to get that. With that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. But before we do, I wanted to address a very quick listener mail. This came in from, I, I don't have permission to say the person's name uh, explicitly or otherwise. So this came in from L. And L begins the email by saying, help me, Bryce Kenobi. You're the only one I can think, uh, only one I think can inform me. Then L goes on to tell a bit about their background uh, as well as uh, they have kids. L took their kids to be babysat by grandma and grandpa. And apparently grandma and grandpa don't very often babysit L's kids because, well, grandma and grandpa are very strong Orthodox people. Whereas L and L's partner are raising the kids to be, you know, agnostic, not have any religious beliefs, which I mean, I would argue is probably superior in many ways. Anyway, so L goes on to say, uh, so all this led up to me, uh, to picking, L's daughter up from my parents' house one night after having them babysit. This is a rare event at this point, seeing them fewer and farther between. The next day, my daughter tells my wife she wants to write Grandpa a letter. Now, this is the what what L's daughter wrote to Grandpa. Quote, Dear Grandpa, 8 
441066. All of the family be sent Gigi, meaning grandma, and pa, and my two sisters' names. Meet them at Gigi's, the father. Amen. End quote. No, this is where Elle says. Now, my daughter is three. Her imagination is blooming, and sure, kids say weird stuff. But I stay. But I was a stay-at-home dad around her every day since she was born, and not once had I ever heard her utter some oddly specific numbers in a row, especially that weren't between one and ten. She was still learning the basics, and we never quote unquote meet at my parents' house. So what do I do? Yeah, scripture references and an obvious group prayer, right? So. This is where Elle says, I'm, I'm trying to check my confirmation bias and conspiracy theories on this, but when I simply Googled these as references, I was dumbfounded, which the numbers that Elle's daughter wrote in this letter at the age of three to dear Ampa, uh, John 8, 44, Mark 10, 6 through 9, or Luke 10, 6, and all of them talk about the father leading the children astray. Uh, John 8, 4, you're, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Mark 10, 6 or 9. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, so on and so forth. And in Luke 10, if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Now, this is where Elle gets to the point after, you know, pr all of the premises built into this email. After ruminating for about a week, I asked my daughter if she thought I lied to her. And she said very solemnly, yes. I asked her if someone told her I lie. And again, yes, that it came from my dad. So take that as it is a week after and from a three-year-old's memory. But there are other things at play nearly a year after this letter. She still gets visibly awkward and uncomfortable when I ask in a normal conversation if her grandparents keep secrets with her. She's mentioned that my father was a god. This is where Elle actually asks a question. Now, Bryce, I would like to know from your perspective, based on this evidence and my parents as 60 plus year old indoctrinated believers alike, do you think that they would have gone to the lengths to seal my daughter to them behind our backs, especially out of fear for my daughter's everlasting soul? Would you put a past two believers to do something like this? Or am I completely unfounded and going into a conspiracy world? I remember hearing from your earlier podcast that temple ceremonies can occur inside a member's home given the circumstances. Is this plausible? Um, Elle says, I don't want to believe that my parents would do something like this, but I just don't trust them to tell me the truth based on how they choose to believe their religion. I'd love to hear your thoughts and appreciate your time. All the best, signed L. Now, let me have, I just have a couple very brief com uh, co uh, comments on that. Grandparents getting sealed to grandchildren is not something that I am aware of ever happening unless it is outside of the Brighamite Salt Lake City LDS Church. That may be something that happens in fundamentalist factions, which from your email, it doesn't seem like these are fundamentalists, but that they believe in the fundamentals of Mormonism, that grandpa is a god, um, and that your that their dad, um, L, is lying to them because of scripture references, right? Um, that I, I don't know if that happened. Ceilings, as far as I'm aware, only happen in the temple when ceilings were occurring in members homes or just in endowment houses. That was before they had actual temples. Those are things that don't occur today outside of actual designated consecrated territory, which is the temples. Once again, this is all with Salt Lake City LDS centric beliefs. If your parents happen to have gone from Salt Lake City LDS into much more fundamentalist sects that don't meet with big temples and have, you know, lots of businesses and propaganda machines, and they just believe in their own version of fundamentalist Mormonism, you know, it's possible, right? Anything is possible. They could believe in a version of Mormonism that grandparents can seal themselves to their grandchildren uh, and, uh, you know, jump over the generation of the parents of those children. Uh, but that is not standard practice, and I have never heard of that happening before in the Salt Lake City Brighamite tradition. Listeners, if you know of something else, um, you know, let me know. I, I would love to to hear, you know, if you've heard stories otherwise that people will get sealed outside of the temple and they will jump over generations for sealings. Now, to another point here, your three-year-old daughter 
having these letter these numbers eight forty four ten six six all of these things uh and then it, signing the father amen at the end of her letter to grandpa um that's not like a conspiracy uh of like kids being able to remember you know numbers that that young of an age um <laughs> and those being tied to scripture references that's literally fundamental piece of Mormonism and most religions is you teach kids really early, you get them while they're young, they're more likely going to be members for a long time. Um, so if you indoctrinate kids with these, these words and these numbers and with these feelings and with these ideas that their father is lying to them at every time, uh, because you're hap you happen to be raising your kids without a belief in the church, the one true church, um, those ideas get into the absorbent minds of little children and it take, it wreaks damage forever for the rest of their lives. They have to deprogram that from their minds when they get to an older age and realize that it's nonsense, that it's not true. So um, it sounds like the relationship between you and your parents, L, is tough. And it sounds like they may be using that as a, a way to indoctrinate your daughter whenever she goes over there. Um, and you know, at least be aware of that's what it sounds like from your email and from what your daughter is saying and the way that she's acting that they are teaching your daughter, they're indoctrinating your daughter, uh, without letting you know much about it, which is troubling, but in their perspective, they're lying for the Lord. They're lying to their son for the Lord so that they can save their granddaughter and live with their granddaughter in heaven. So be empathetic towards your parents, because at one point you believe too, that they are doing what they perceive as a morally good thing. Right. Um, I've heard a lot of stories of people who their kids become in, in mixed faith marriages or in mixed faith divorces, uh, usually, uh, catalyzed by transition, a faith transition of one of the members of a marriage, uh, kids become weaponized and that can be deliberate or just, you know, it just matter of factly, it just sort of happens that the kids are taught something and that they're, they're taught something that they understand that they should stay away from the non-believing parent because they're a dirty, scary agnostic or atheist. It's not easy. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry you're in that position L and I hope that, Whatever you take away from this, I hope it helps. Um, but, you know, I wish I had some more solid answers for you, Al. All right, we're going to go ahead and shut it down. I wish that was, uh, we ended on a better note than that. Uh, but, hey, if you're a Patreon supporter, uh, i got a real fun story for you uh, on the Patreon exclusive fees. So let's go ahead and shut it down for the podcast tonight. If you want to get in touch with me, you can do so. NakedMormonism at gmail.com, just like L did, just like many other people have uh, that you know I didn't respond to on air but have responded to directly. Uh, and thanks to all of you who rate the show or who follow us on uh, on any of Facebook or your social media of choice. And of course, thank you so much for hitting the download button and sticking with us through the end of this rather long episode. And of course, thank you so much for lending me your ear. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Cast is produced with help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a lost state of mind.com and used with permission. 
Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.